Hi, not just from 10 minute physics here. Welcome to tutorial number 16. Today I will show you how to run simulations on the GPU. And as we will see, writing code for the GPU is easy and fun. And you will get huge speed ups. So let's start. As usual for the slides and demos, have a look at my webpage at www.matthiasmuller.info slash 10 minute physics. Here is a teaser simulation. This piece of cloth contains 250,000 particles, 500,000 triangles and 1.5 million distance constraints. The simulation runs at about 30 frames per second. With 30 sub-steps this means that the GPU solves 1.35 billion distance constraints per second. I will put the code for this demo on my page. It's a Python script. At the end of the tutorial I will explain how to run it. Now let me give you some background on how to simulate on the GPU. GPUs are perfect for simulations. They are designed to apply a single program to multiple objects. In graphics, a rendering program, also called a shader, is applied to calculate the color of each pixel on the screen. For simulations, we run a single program, also called a kernel, for many particles or for many constraints. Let us have a look at a very simple example, the velocity update of position-based dynamics. I discussed this in tutorial number 9. At each simulation step, we run through all the particles. We update the velocities, store the positions in the previous positions and update the positions by adding delta t times the velocity. Next we solve all the constraints individually. Finally we update the velocities as the positions after the solve minus the positions before the solve divided by delta t. It is the for all statements that lend themselves to be parallelized. Now how can we put the velocity update on the GPU? From a hardware point of view, we have the motherboard with the CPU, also called the host, and the graphics card with the GPU, also called the device. The GPU contains a large number of individual compute units or cores. The RTX 3090, for instance, has over 10,000 of them. A thread is the execution of the kernel on one core. Each thread has a unique ID. There can be more threads than cores. In that case, each core executes more than one thread sequentially. The graphics card has its own memory. Therefore, we have to store the velocities, the previous positions and the positions on the graphics card. We use the thread ID as the particle number such that each thread computes the velocity for exactly one particle. We don't need all the buffers in the main memory as well. For rendering, for instance, we only need the positions of the particles. In this case, we use a DMA to copy the positions from the GPU to the CPU memory. How can we implement this? One way is to use the CUDA library and write C++ programs. Now there is a much easier way. You can write GPU simulations with Python and our new Python extension called Warp. You can create standalone projects or a plugin for NVIDIA Omniverse. Omniverse offers all you need in terms of visualization and interaction. I will talk about Omniverse plugins in an upcoming tutorial. Have a look at NVIDIA's developer site for the Warp documentation. Warp is also available on GitHub. Now let's see how we can implement the PBD velocity update with Warp. First we include the Warp library. Then we define the buffers. We need the position, previous position and velocity buffers on the GPU. We also allocate the position buffer on the CPU. Next we write the kernel as a Python function and declare it to be a warp kernel. The kernel takes as input the buffer's previous position, position and velocity. We interpret the thread ID as the particle number. Next we simply implement the position based dynamics velocity update. That's it. There is a special warp function to launch the kernel. First we specify the name of the kernel, then the inputs the number of threads and finally whether it should be executed on the GPU or on the CPU. After the execution we read back the particle positions. There are two main challenges when writing GPU code. The first one are threads that write to the same locations. In per-particle loops each thread writes to a separate entry in the array. However, in the case where we execute one thread per constraint, multiple threads typically write to the same location in an array. In this example here, we have 4 particles and 5 distance constraints. Here threads 2, 3 and 5 all update the position of particle 2. 
The problem that arises here is that if one thread starts adding its computed correction, before the addition operation of other threads is finished, the previous addition is lost. The solution to this problem is simple. We can use the work command atomic add, which makes sure that threads have to wait with executing their add until other threads writing to the same location are done. This can slow down execution slightly. The second problem are simultaneous reads and adds. We take the same setup as an example. The XPBD position corrections computed by thread number 3 depend on the locations of particles 2 and 3. Therefore, we get a different result before or after threads 2 and 5 have added their corrections. Since threads are not executed in a predefined order, the result is non-deterministic, which can yield jittering. There are two popular solutions here. The first is to use a Jacobi solver, and the second is to use graph coloring. The CPU solver of XPBD runs through all the constraints and immediately adds corrections to the particles. This algorithm is also called gauss seidel For Jacobi solve, we use an additional buffer which stores corrections for each particle, here called D. At the beginning of the solve, we set all entries to zero. Then in the constraint solve kernels, we do not apply corrections to the particles, but sum them up in the correction buffer. We do this using atomic operations. Only after the solve, we apply these corrections to the particles. The advantage of this method is that particle positions are not changed during the solve. Therefore, all threads work with the same particle positions. The method is also quite easy to implement. The disadvantages are, Jacobi converges more slowly than gauss seidel due to the slower error propagation. Also, we get possible overshootings. This is why we scale the corrections by a scalar s smaller than 1. One idea is to simply average all corrections. This does not work very well, unfortunately, because momentum conservation is violated. Also, the strength of a constraint depends on the number of adjacent constraints, which yields artifacts. So what we typically do is to use a global magic value of s, typically about one fourth. It has to be adjusted to the current simulation setup. The second method is to use graph coloring. Here the idea is to use multiple constraint solve passes. Each pass process is a subset of independent constraints. This method is stable and we don't have to choose a magic S. Let's take as an example a regular cloth mesh without shear resistance. In this case we can split the constraints into four subsets. Blue, yellow, green and red. In each pass a particle position is only touched by at most one constraint. This case is easy, but what about the general case? Now we are faced with a mathematical problem. Given a graph, color all the edges with as few colors as possible, such that no pair of edges with the same color touches the same node. Finding the optimal solution is NP-hard. This means that it is very likely that there is no better way to do this than to test all the possible colorings. Of course, this is not feasible because the number of colorings increases exponentially with the number of constraints. Fortunately, there is a quite simple algorithm, the greedy algorithm. It does not find the optimal solution, but typically a good one. It is also more general and can handle constraints with more than two adjacent particles. It works as follows. While there exist unmarked constraints, create a new set. Clear all the particle marks. Then for all unmarked constraints C, if no adjacent particle is marked, add C to S. Mark C and mark all the adjacent particles. Even with the best solution, many passes are typically required. We need at least as many passes as the largest number of constraints touching one particle. Here is a typical set size distribution. We have a few large sets in the beginning, followed by a long tail of smaller ones. A simple way to reduce the number of passes is to solve the entire tail with one Jacobi iteration. For cloth, for instance, it makes sense to only solve the stretching constraints with coloring. Handling the bending and the shear constraints with Jacobi is fine because they don't need to be as stiff. Now let's have a look at the demo. In order to be able to use warp, you need to set up a Python environment once. There's a nice website that explains how to install Python and connect it with Visual Studio Code. After this, we are able to step through Python code inside Visual Studio Code.
Warp has a strong connection with NumPy. Installing NumPy is super easy. Just type pip install NumPy in the console. The same is true for Warp. Simply type pip install warp lang. My demo uses pyopengl. People on the internet suggest to visit this page. It has links to a lot of Python libraries stored as wheel files. Download pyopengl accelerate and pyopengl from there. Make sure you pick the right versions. Once downloaded, you can install the files using the pip install command. As mentioned before, you can download my demo at my 10 minute physics web page. I will put all these links in the description below. I will also update them in case things change in the future. Let me finally give you a very short overview of the code. At the start, I have a documentation of how to interact with the demo. Then we have some general settings like the dimension of the cloth. Now follows the cloth object. In the init method, I set up the cloth and all the constraints. Here you see the integration kernel that integrates the particles and handles the simple collisions. This is the kernel that solves distance constraints. Then we have the add corrections kernel that is only used in the Jacobi case. Here then is the update velocity kernel that I showed in the slides. In the simulation method, I run n substeps. First I call the integration kernel. Then, depending on the type of the solver, I only do Jacobi solves, or I go through multiple passes and check whether a pass is independent or not. If the pass contains independent constraints, I just solve them on the particle positions. Otherwise, I solve them Jacobi style. Finally, I launch the update velocity kernel and copy the positions on the graphics card back to the host. Then I define a raycast kernel to support dragging of the cloth. This is the method that renders the cloth using OpenGL. From the middle of the code down, you see the implementation of the viewer. It has a camera controller. Finally, it handles all the GLUT callbacks and sets up OpenGL. At the very end, it calls the GLUT main loop. This concludes the tutorial. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and I see you in the next tutorial.